This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Let's go through and have a look at two small additional bits that are part of IS19. They're looking at curtailments and asset ceilings. Before we look at them specifically in detail, uh, just a bit about where you're likely to see them within the exam. Uh, they have been tested previously. Uh, they have been seen primarily in question two and question three where there's maybe a little bit more marks available than, say, in question one. Because in question two or question three, it's very much more discursive in nature, isn't it? So, therefore, there's some explanation that's required, and there is more, if you like, to go through and explain, as opposed to just crunching the numbers. It's crunching the numbers that you see, isn't it, in question number one. You know, those 35 marks, 63 minutes, when you just crunch the numbers on the financial statement, isn't it? Okay, here, however... We're thinking more question two or question three focus. Doesn't mean to say it won't crop up in question one or couldn't. It could, but preference, I suppose, is for the more discursive aspects in questions two or three. So first one that we have there is a curtailment. Now, a curtailment arises by definition where there is a significant number of employees who leave the scheme. So one situation could be that your company is operating a defined benefit scheme. And it's too expensive for the company to run, so they move it onto the less risky, cheaper defined contribution scheme. If that's the case, there is a big change in the numbers of the people who are there on the defined benefit scheme. The other alternative that you've got is whereby maybe there is a reorganization of the business. If there's a reorganization of the business, there may be redundancies. And if people are made redundant, then they are no longer part of that scheme, are they? Okay. So if you have a significant change in the number of employees, which is what is happening in terms of redundancy, in terms of moving from one scheme to another, then that means that there is a curtailment. If you can identify the curtailment, explain that you have identified the curtailment and then explain the accounting treatment. All the curtailment requires is that both the asset and liability are re-measured to fair value. So you just reassess the value of the asset you reassess the value of the liabilities. And if there is a change, so increases or decreases in assets or liabilities, then that there is taken to profit or loss. And when it is taken to profit or loss, it is treated there as a service cost. OK, excellent. That's it. Nothing to it. Uh, so know what the curtailment is, know the treatment and then be able to apply it. So it says here, explain the accounting treatment of the curtailment in the financial statements. So Flanagan announces the reorganisation of its business, resulting in the loss of jobs. So that therefore means, doesn't it, that those two things combined mean that you have a curtailment, don't we? If that's the case, you need to remeasure the assets and liabilities to fair value and any changes go immediately to profit or loss like a service cost. Okay. So it says the fair value of the plan assets and liabilities immediately before the reorganization were 48 and 60 million respectively. So we had, was it net liabilities there of 12? Uh, and it says that, that the plan assets do not change, but the pension liabilities are remeasured at 55 million. So what you've got there is you have a reduction in your liability. A reduction in a liability is a gain. It's a bit of a bonus. I'd have thought normally that you would make a loss uh, when you go through there and remeasure the pension scheme because normally you have to compensate the employees for being made redundant or compensate them from leaving the, the better scheme going to the worse scheme. So going from the defined benefit to the defined contribution scheme. So normally the liabilities go up, but in this example, the liabilities have gone down. And if liabilities have gone down, you have a gain and that gain is equal to the difference is that there of five million dollars. That gain goes immediately there to profit or loss. Quite nice, isn't it? A nice big gain of five million dollars as part of the reorganisation. As I said, unlikely to happen in reality. In reality, normally you remeasure the liability and the value of the liability goes up uh, because you need to pay the employees more to compensate for their loss of job or to compensate them for the fact that they are moving to a, a, a less beneficial and more risky to them pension scheme being the defined contribution. Okay. 
hex and that's it. Told you there's nothing much to these bits of the syllabus. Uh, what you've got then is going through and looking at what's referred to as is it the asset ceiling. So if we go through there and look at the asset ceiling, uh, the asset ceiling is thinking about the world of prudence. OK, uh, and it's something that you could see within the exam, possibly not something that you see within the real world, because it only really arises when you have an overall pension asset. And I would encourage you to try and find a company that operates a defined benefit pension scheme that has a net pension asset on their financial statements. There are many around because the value of stocks and shares and investments has tended to fall in recent years. And therefore, it has fallen below the value of the liabilities, which keeps going up and up and up and up. So it's only a situation whereby you have a net pension asset. And when we're thinking about a net pension asset, we need to be prudent. OK, we cannot recognize too high an asset figure. So what we want to go through and do is we want to curtail or if you like cap the value of the asset. Now, what do we cap the value of the asset to? The asset ceiling. But how do we work out the asset ceiling and what is it? Well, if you think about having an asset, an excess of assets over liabilities, that means that the scheme is performing very well. The value of the assets has gone up and it more than substantially covers the value of the liability. So if that's the case, then do you need to pay in any money at this moment in time into the pension scheme? Oh, you don't need to, do you? OK, the liabilities are going to go up again next year, but hopefully the scheme assets will increase yet further. So what you can do, and it was in the old days a way of raising finance for a business, was that they used to take a pension holiday. Yeah, that They didn't contribute into the company's pension scheme uh, and they could then use that money to invest elsewhere. So what we're going to go through and do is we're going to look at that money that potentially you are going to go through and save by not investing within the scheme. And you are going to discount those savings back to present value. So if you discount that saving back to present value, then that is the asset ceiling. That's the maximum value of the asset that you can recognise. You don't have to calculate it. You'll be given it within the exam. If the value of the asset in the financial statement is above the value of the asset ceiling, you need to reduce the value of the pension asset to the asset ceiling. Whereabout does that reduction in asset go? Well, a reduction in asset has to be an expense and it would have to go through there, wouldn't it? Through profit or loss. OK, it's a realised, if you like, expense. OK, so what have we got? It says explain how the net pension asset will be treated in the financial statements. The explanation is what's above there, isn't it? Uh, but in terms of the numbers, it says here, Brannigan has a net pension asset in its statement of financial position of 30 million. Uh, it therefore anticipates that it will not have to pay its usual contributions into the scheme for the next few years. So what you're looking at there is that we are making savings into the future because we are not having to contribute into the scheme because it is in surplus. It is estimated that the present value of the future reduction in contributions will be 26 million. So is that 26 million not referred to as the asset ceiling? OK, so we cannot go through there and recognise the asset above the 26 million. So how do we treat it within the financial statements? Well, what we would show there is within the SFP, you would show an asset. Is it at 26 million? And then there within the statement of profit or loss, you would have there. Is it four million dollars as an expense being the reduction from the 30 down to the 26. That's it. Nothing much to it. Uh, you just need to be able to go through and define the curtailment, define the asset ceiling, look at the accounting treatment for each of the curtailments and the asset ceiling, and then play around with the numbers. So potentially three things under each heading. The numbers will be very simple and they'll be there within question number one. Uh, if there was numbers and explanation, we're thinking they're more along the lines of question two or question three. Other than that, that's the end of pensions. Uh, there isn't a huge amount to it. It's a fairly 
interesting standard. Did I just say the word interesting? Yes, it is. We can associate interesting with the world of accountancy because, you know, here it does apply to real world scenarios. You may be there with a pension scheme at work and you can think now, is it defined benefit? Is it defined contribution? And how your company will account for it. Okay. Uh, other than that, that's everything to do with pensions. So I will go through there and pardon the pun. I will curtail the session here and I will see you within the next session.